Happy Solstice, Happy Hanukkah, and have a wonderful festival of the Kalends if you're into uh, Mithraic cults. But not quite yet. Merry Christmas. In a few days, we might be there. Today, we're talking about Thor Chain, Thor Swap in particular. Why? Because uh, when I did a video on Rango Exchange, which is a dex slash bridge aggregator, I have tons of requests to look at ThorSwap as a potential alternative to Rango. So I did, of course, I got to talk to the team. Thank you, team. Uh, and learn about ThorSwap and ThorChain. I'm not going to focus on ThorChain. I think that deserves its own video. But I am going to look at ThorSwap. I am going to look at Thor, Thor Swap's urn, and I will compare it directly to Rango, uh, sort of as was requested by the community. So without further ado, I'm Steven, the Calculator Guy, founder of DeFi Dojo Discord, and let's dive right on in. All right, when you arrive at ThorSwap, you're met with this nice user interface that's pretty easy to use. One of the first things you'll notice is that there are not that many chains available. However, despite there only being one, two, three chains really available plus synthetics, you do have many native assets uh, to choose from from a variety of different chains. One of the most interesting native assets is Bitcoin. So you can take actual native Bitcoin and bridge it onto uh, different chains directly from you know, the Bitcoin network. This is something you can't do on Rango. And so right now we already have a use case for this. Uh, granted, you're probably not going to have the most price efficient swap this way. You could go through a centralized exchange, uh, take your native Bitcoin on a centralized exchange and then swap it to some other assets and bridge it off that way. That'll, that'll probably be the most cost efficient. However, some people want zero exposure to centralized exchanges. And I respect that and I appreciate that. And so this is one of the ways in which you could do that. So let's take one Bitcoin, bridge it to BTCB on the Binance chain and see what we get. We get a negative 2.5% price impact, pretty hefty. Now, one of the things that the team told me is that the price impact, which is also called the slippage fees, uh, is oftentimes scaled with the size, not necessarily scaled with actual slippage. So if you do a smaller size, let's say 0.1, you get a smaller fee and you can do that smaller size, you know, 10 times in this case to get that smaller fee for your full one Bitcoin. I know it seems wonky, but that's the way it works. And it's kind of a cheat code, kind of a hack. Uh, and I like that. I'm glad that I talked to the team to sort of get that, uh, you know, cheat from them. So again, instead of doing one Bitcoin and taking that, let's see what it is. Take, Instead of doing one Bitcoin, taking that 2.5% fee on your one Bitcoin, you could do 0.1 Bitcoin 10 times and each time take a 0.85% uh, fee. Now, if you don't understand math, that means you'll take a 0.85% on the full one Bitcoin having everything done. Now, there are fees as well, and you will have to eat those fees each time. So do the math to make sure that it's, you know, uh, still, still better. I will tell you in this case, it certainly is. All right. Uh, so we know we can take native Bitcoin and bring it onto other chains. We could bring it onto, you know, the Ethereum chain as USDC if we wanted to. Um, again, here we're going to have a point, we're going to have a 1% price impact, kind of substantial there. Uh, but if you really wanted to go from native Bitcoin to USDC on, on ERC-20 and you didn't want to use a central exchange, this is a good means to do that. Also, if you're done with proof of stake, right, you're, you're tired of uh, these validators validating, you're tired of all this staking nonsense. You think that Bitcoin is the way to go. You've you become a Bitcoin maxi. You can take your assets straight from Ethereum and bring them onto Bitcoin. Look at this. Uh, you're taking $1,600, bring it right onto Bitcoin, only experiencing a 0.373% price impact. That's pretty decent, right? But there is uh, a, a bit of a gas fee, right? Because you are using the Ethereum network, roughly $14.78, so almost $15. Do keep that in mind. Now, how does this work? Let's look at the route, right? The path here. So the way Thor swap and Thor chain works is it will take, uh, well, first let me explain the notation here. This is the chain. This is the assets. This is USDC on the Ethereum chain to Ethereum on the Ethereum chain to Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain. All right. Now that we understand that, let's explain how this works. So this is going to be using Thor chain and Uniswap V3. I am pinching, but it's not working. Uh, let me pinch and then click, right? So basically you can see it's going to Ethereum using Uniswap, then ThorChain. The way ThorChain works is the native asset, or wrapped na native asset, so wrapped Ethereum in this case, is going to go to ThorChain and on ThorChain it gets converted to Rune, 
And then while it's on ThorChain, it goes from Rune to Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain. So on ThorChain, Rune is sort of the intermediary that spits it out on the other chains. Uh, now, pretty cool method of action. And you're not really exposed to Rune because it happens in a split second. But you should be aware that uh, Rune is sort of the intermediary asset on the Thor chain for all of this um, chain to chain bridge swapping. All right, cool. One more thing I'll mention is that while Rango and ThorSwap are competitors, they have different risk profiles. Rango is a DEX and bridge aggregator. ThorSwap is a DEX aggregator that allows you to swap between chains. Now, why is it not a bridge aggregator? Because it only uses ThorChain for the cross-chain settlement. So everything will be using ThorChain, you know, using that rune as an intermediary to spit it out on different chains, whereas Rango will choose the best bridge all across DeFi uh, to get that asset to the other side, which means you might be exposed to bridges that have slowdowns or um, congestion, and your swap may not happen sometimes for hours after you send it through because of bridge congestion. So, you know, uh, different things to consider, certainly. Let's check out some swaps and compare between Rango and Thor swap. So the first one, let's go, yeah, USGC from ERC20 to, let's go AVAX and um, Link, right? Why not Link? And we'll do $1,000. So $1,000 of USDC to Link on the Avalanche C chain. And while we wait, let's get this set up over here. So we'll go for $1,000 from the Ethereum chain, USDC, native USDC, uh, to link on the Avalanche chain. So we're gonna go link, it'll be a link E, it's what they have available. Okay, let's compare. So here, we're gonna be using Kyber Swap to go from Ethereum USDC to Ethereum ETH, and then it's going to go through the Thor chain to wrapped AVAX on the Avalanche C chain, and then it's gonna use Pangolin to swap that wrapped AVAX to Link E. Now we're gonna hit a 2.14% price impact, pretty steep price impact in my opinion, but it might still be better than Rango. Let's check out Rango. Now Rango only has a 0.36% price impact, so we're gonna be getting 167.5 Link, whereas we're getting only 165.9 link here. So in this particular case, Rango is superior. Uh, and this this is using just Seabridge. So everything is being done on Seabridge apparently. If you want to do this yourself, maybe you could go to Seabridge and see if you can get even a better rate without any fees from Rango. Uh, for complex swaps, sometimes I'll use Rango, but if it's just a one-step uh, swap, sometimes I'll just do it myself and, uh, and avoid the fees. Let's try something a little bit different to see where the major benefits from ThorSwap come in. If we, let's say, want to take native Atom and swap it to, I don't know, why not try BTCB, right? Which is uh, Binance Bitcoin, Binance Wrapped Bitcoin. And we want to do, um, let's say, a thousand Atom. You're taking a pretty big price impact, right? A pretty big um, slippage issue here at, at, at negative 2.6%. Uh, let's try the same trade on Rango. So we're going to do native native Atom to BTCB on the Binance Smart Chain. And we're doing a thousand, right? A thousand Atom. Let's see what happens. Look, it's even using ThorChain. It's using ThorChain and Seabridge, and you're getting a 6.48% price impact. So Seriously, in this case, ThorSwap is better. Now, why do I think that is? Well, anything that utilizes the IBC will tend to, and this this is um, like the Cosmos ecosystem and, and system of chains, uh, will tend to favor ThorSwap. So here we're going from native Atom, which is about the most IBC asset you can have, to the Binance Smart Chain, which is technically within the IBC ecosystem, and you're getting a better rate. Now, like I said before, uh, if you do smaller sizes, how does this work? Okay, well, usually smaller sizes tend to be better, but in this case, a small size is worse. So you can, I guess, play around with the size, see what's best. In this case, 100 is better than 1,000, but one is way worse than 100. So you might wanna do 10 swaps of 100 rather than one swap of 1,000 or 1,000 swaps of one. Uh, so here, 
it's 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 just going to use Thorchain um, to get you from Atom to BTCB. It's going to use BTC Synthetic to do that, which is the major benefit of Thorswap is that they have these synthetics. So let's talk about these synthetics in the Earn section. So before I do that, I just want to point out that there are definitely cases like we just showed here where utilizing Thor swap is going to be superior to using something like Rango. And I think that uh, you should definitely choose the one that is superior and within your risk reward when you're making your cross chain swaps or cross chain when you're doing cross chain bridging. All right. Uh, so earn, how does this work? Why is it interesting? Why am I, uh, you know, on the fence about it? So first we can see you're getting a yield on what you might think is native Bitcoin here at uh, 5.51%, which is a really good yield on native Bitcoin if it was on native Bitcoin, but it's not on native Bitcoin. This, these yields are on the synthetic versions of these assets on the Thor chain. So this is synthetic Bitcoin, synthetic Ethereum, synthetic BNB. However, you can deposit utilizing native Bitcoin if you wanted to. And what you'll see is you can get some slippage, right? Get some slippage here of about 2.3%, 2.4%. Now, very similarly to uh, Thor swap, if you break that down into, into bite-sized pieces, this is a, now it's a, it's a, uh, instead of a 2%, or sorry, 0.2% uh, slippage, now you're getting a, or 0.24% slippage, now you're getting a 0.2% slippage. So the slippage is slightly better if you do it in small chunks, uh, but of course there'll be fees, so do consider those, right? So anyways, you take your native assets, convert it to the synthetic asset to deposit it. Now, if you're paying 0.2%, let's say, uh, to enter, and you're paying 0.2% uh, to exit, then, you know, is it still within your risk reward? You, you're roughly paying um, 0.5, right? You're paying 0.5% uh, to enter and exit. Well, 0.5% out of 5.5 is roughly going to take a month to, to overcome. So you're going to give up a yield, a month's worth of yield, uh, to be exposed to a synthetic version of BTC and get a 5.51% APR. Is that worth it for you um, rather than just holding on to your native Bitcoin in your own sort of cold storage wallet? For some people, maybe. It's like, you know, this is almost at capacity, 72% filled. Uh, for some people, maybe not. Now, let's talk about these synthetics. How do they work? When a synthetic is minted against a native asset, you, would, you might think, that the backing of the synthetic is that native asset, but it's not. What actually happens is that native asset, that native Bitcoin is gonna be broken in half, and then half it is sold into Rune. So that what's actually backing these synthetics is the native asset Rune liquidity pool. Now, of course, you know, these things can only be minted up to like 15% uh, LTV, which is quite a safe LTV for the backing, which means you know they're they're highly over collateralized, uh, 15 times what eight, so they're almost 800% over collateralized. However, they're they're pushing that 15% to 30% soon, which means they'll only be 300%, maybe 333% over collateralized, and then they're going to try to push that to 50%, which means they'll only be 200% over collateralized. And at that point, I start to get worried because what if? What if the rune asset starts to go down dramatically or very quickly for whatever reason, right? Could be a, a black swan event. That might mean that these synthetic assets, which are backed by LPs and not backed by native assets only, could be unbacked or under collateralized, right? If the LP value falls faster than the total value of synthetics, then the synthetics may not be able to be redeemed for the full value later on. Now this is a edge case. This is this is sort of like my worst case scenario. This is my what if. Uh, and there are many mechanisms to prevent this. Um, one of them being like the, the APRs. The APRs will dry up far before that happens, which means most people will be uh, unminting and going back into their native assets, which will, re which will put the collateral ratios in a much healthier place. However, it is something I am concerned about when the uh, backing of the synthetics is not just the native assets themselves. So, you know, you should be aware of this mechanism, but um, certainly do your own risk reward, do your own diligence when considering whether or not these yields are for you. All right, now that's pretty much the, the extent of what I want to talk about in terms of ThorSwap. There are other things you can do. You can sort of send 
uh, and receive from your Thor wallet if you want to. There's a nice little dashboard where it tells you all about, you know, the liquidity and the volume and what's going on here. Uh, also, these LPs are available. Um, I should do a video on the Thor swap, Thor chain LPs at some point, um, but I'm not going to talk about them now because that would take another 10 to 15 minutes. So I'll keep that as its sort of own uh, its own thing, but I will talk about the Thor staking. So Thor is like the native asset of Thor swap, or it's a governance asset of Thor swap, not Thor chain, Thor swap. Uh, and if you stake your Thor, you will get a portion of the affiliate fees of other exchanges or uh, applications like wallets that utilize Thor swap as uh, as a as a means to swap assets. So you know how MetaMask has its own sort of uh, native swapping built in. Other wallets have native swapping too. And if they utilize ThorSwap as as its exchange uh, layer, then ThorSwap can generate affiliate fees from that. And I think 75% of those affiliate fees from those swap fees go to uh, Thor stakers. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I think that's uh, it's worth noting. You know, also current APY is 21.29%. If you're interested in having long exposure to some fun assets, maybe uh, the God of Thunder is for you. So what's my what's my overall take? What's my takeaway? Right? What do I think? Uh, well, my personal take is that I like Rango. I like the Orswap. I think that they have two very different use cases. If I'm going to be swapping between IBC assets, I will probably try Thorswap first, but I will test it against Rango. I think ThorSwap will probably win nine out of 10 times uh, if I'm doing IBC transfers. Now, if I'm doing, or if I'm doing like IBC to, to Avalanche or IBC to Ethereum, probably ThorSwap is still gonna be the best. Now, if I'm going to try to swap between like Kronos chain or any of the chains not supported here, which is a, you know, a lot of chains, we have one, two, three chain supported here, where we have 50 chains supported here, I'm gonna try Rango. Does that mean I'm going to do the entire swap on Rango? No, I'm probably going to do, I'm going to try the swap on Mango, Rango. And if it's a very simple swap, right? Utilizing minimal protocols, I may do it manually myself to avoid fees. If it's using, I don't know, like 10 protocols, I'm going to just let Rango do it for me, uh, thank them for their service and be happy to give them a very small fee, right? So that's sort of my, my takeaway from this. Uh, I am glad that I learned about ThorSwap. I am glad that I now have it as one of the many tools that I can use when I'm doing cross-chain transfers and swaps. And I do hope that it is uh, widely successful in the future. I worry that it is too dependent on the Rune asset, both for the backing of the synthetics, as well as, as the intermediary for all cross-chain swaps. Uh, does that mean it's a vulnerability that is something you should worry about? I don't know. Uh, I genuinely don't know. And I would love to maybe interview um, some of the founders to see their take on those risks um, and to potentially dissuade me of my concerns. Uh, so that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to come talk to the most brilliant minds in all of DeFi, of course, I recommend the DeFi Dojo Discord. Free for one month. Don't like it. Don't pay for it. Uh, it's incredible. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful rest of your day.